The Lord be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Take care not to perform righteous deeds in order that people may see them. Otherwise, you will have no recompense from your heavenly Father. When you give alms, do not blow a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, to gain the praise of others. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be in secret. Your heavenly Father, who sees in secret, will repay you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that others may see them. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. When you fast, Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They neglect their appearance so that they may appear to others as to be fasting. Amen, I say to you, they have their their reward. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to others to be fasting except to your Father who is hidden. And your Father who sees what is hidden will repay you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Today celebrates the memorial of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. He died at the age of 23 in 1591. He was rather a rather prodigious uh, young boy uh, at the age of seven He had an awakening, religious or spiritual awakening at nine. He was uh, reading uh, catechisms, et cetera. At 13, he was teaching catechism. He came from the uh, famously known Castiglione family. No, it wasn't the mafia. (laughs) uh, In Italy, and uh, rather well-to-do. And he, after a four-year struggle with his father, Uh, yielded or surrendered his inheritance uh, to join the Jesuits. He was in the early stages of the long journey of Jesuit formation, and he had a particular love for youth as at 13, again, he was teaching catechism to the children and youth of his time. There was, I don't know that it was a plague so much, but certainly a, a virulent illness in the cities at that time, And uh, as part of his formation, he was working in the hospitals and to succumb to that illness uh, at the age of 23. Uh, Aloysius is the patron of youth and um, is honored today not only for his zeal for God uh, and his love of God's word, but for his yielding um, in light of the readings, the wealth and the ease of life that could have been his. It's always interesting to me to hear about these um, movements of grace. Uh, This experience that he had was called an awakening. It wasn't a conversion. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't, you know, somehow God knocked him off a horse like St. Paul. But it was very obvious to Aloysius and maybe to those around him that there was an awakening. He was sincerely uh, inclined or drawn to, to God. You could say the spiritual life, but I mean, that, that's God. So in light of our readings today, <clears throat> Paul still, still seems to be on this whole theme of, of, of fundraising or, or charity. God loves the cheerful giver. But as one devotional says this morning, well, God, lo- you know, God still loves the, um, the uh, grumpy ones too. <clears throat> the point there would be, and more pertinently in the gospel, 
that we all know by uh, experience, or not, that as Paul so pointedly says, those who give sparingly will receive sparingly, but those who give bountifully will reap bountifully. I must be doing pretty good because God sure is good to me. Now some will say, well, you see, he's bragging again. No, that's a fact. God is very good to me in complete disproportion to how good I am to God, which means other people, because the way we love other people is the way we love God. Oh, I hate it when he says that. <laughs> That's embarrassing, isn't it? But isn't that true? We are all God's children. We say that. And in some ways, I, I did very much appreciate the uh, reflection in Word Among Us today, one that I, I had not myself considered, at least to my memory, <clears throat> you would certainly recognize this reading because we read it every Ash Wednesday. It's always the first read, it's always the gospel on Ash Wednesday every year. On that day, it would seem to have a tone of penitence, would it not? Because in land, we increase our prayer, our fasting, and our almsgiving. Maybe it's this very passage out of which comes that particular protocol or design of our Lenten identity. The insight or the reflection from Word Among Us today pointed out that we can recall the baptism of Jesus where the Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The person writing the devotion today said, take note that Jesus says, your heavenly Father. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be secret and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. So Jesus is sharing or giving to us, identifying us with, the same relationship with the Father that he has. I think that's of some pertinence for us, is it not? We become so familiar with the language that, oh yeah, well yeah, God's my Father, and, and again, we have the tension today, and it's a legitimate tension. God does not, does not have one gender or the other. You know, why do we have to use male language for God? Well, Jesus did. I think that's a pretty good high standard. Even though God has no gender, Jesus being a son has to have a father. We are sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters of Jesus. If anyone has any mature degree of, of reflection capacity within them, they will take note that the same God that is father to Jesus is your father. So why does Matthew, or Jesus in this case, who's speaking the words and Matthew who's recording them, why does he highlight alms in prayer and fasting? Because those tend to be, perhaps, in light of today's occasion to read this, they tend to be, or they certainly were in the time of Jesus, occasions where people could flaunt their religious devotion. In the temple, there were, um, as I've read, I guess we would call, uh, you know, the horn of plenty. You know, the, you know, the big tube with the big mouth that you know, kind of goes down. And, um, you know, they would have all these tubes. And people would come and they would throw their coins into the tubes. Sounds weird, right? But they would throw their money in there and people would stand around to listen to the clink. So they could tell, well, was that a quarter? Was that a 50 cent piece? Was that a half a dollar? You know, whatever. And so people would kind of pay attention to who's giving what. Note here, again, we can pull in the scripture of the widow's mite. She threw in what we would say two cents. Oh, look at that one. But that's all she had. Further, as Paul points out, and Jesus says um, less directly, when we give alms, 
whether it's charity in dollars and cents or the charity of kindness and compassion and forgiveness and mercy when we pray, whether we're interceding for ourselves or others, whether we're praying in praise and worship simply to love God, when we're fasting because we want to lose weight, or we're fasting because we're supplicating to God, we have a wearisome problem, and we want to purify or cleanse ourselves so that we can perhaps make ourselves more presentable or acceptable to God. These kinds of things reveal the quality of the heart. So back to St. Paul. God loves the cheerful giver, and that is the one who gives sincerely out of love. You know, as well as I, in a good day, you know, it's just, I need to give this, I, I want to give this, you know, whatever the reality is. And it comes with sincerity and the love of the heart. There's other days, oh my God, they just want money again. My uncle, Father Tom, has been dead six years now. He still gets more mail than I do. And most of it are solicitations. And I just have to throw them away. And you think about global warming and all of that. Why don't we have a law about all that junk? Different homily. Today, think about what we give back to God is an expression of our love for God in our awareness of all that God's given us. It might alert us or invite us to think about all the personal ways that your Father, your Heavenly Father, personally, uniquely loves you. Now, God has an awful lot of children, but God loves each of us uniquely and personally and specifically in our own frame of life. God knows not only who we are and what we do, he knows every cell of our being. So if you're feeling the favor, the blessing, the kindness, the grace, the forgiveness of God, your Father's being good to you, so that when we're generous with dollars and cents or charity or mercy or kindness or simply a, a good Christian compassion, we're thanking God because God deserves to be thanked. But God doesn't need the money. So again, it's the challenge to do these things with love for our brothers and sisters who are in one form of need or the other. That's the cheerful giver. May God be praised by our worship these days, all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do. Jesus, this day, in your goodness and in your spirit, may your name be praised.